Hi, good afternoon. I'm Mike Duran, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Uh, and today, it's my great honor to have a conversation with David Albright, the president of the Institute for Science and International Security. That's uh, the good ISIS. David, welcome. Oh, thank you. Good to be here. Uh, as you all know, David is the foremost expert in the country um, and one of the foremost experts in the world um, on nuclear weapons and nuclear nonproliferation. And he's here today to talk to us about um, the JCPOA in general, but the, the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, David has just written a book uh, coming out, I think, in, uh, in June. Is that right? May, May, May 17th. On May, on May 17th. Um, about the Ahmad program, uh, that's the, uh, the secret Iranian uh, program to build a nuclear weapon, about, with, about which we know much more now, uh, thanks to the nuclear archive, which the Israelis uh, spirited out of uh, Tehran. Uh, so let me start then, David, with a, a question about the, uh, the nuclear archive. Um, maybe you could just tell us, what did we learn from the archive? Because the, uh, when, when Prime Minister Netanyahu first announced uh, that uh, they had uh, taken the archive, there was a, a, a spate of articles in the American press which said there's nothing new here. Uh, and I, I think uh, you disagree with that. Yeah, no, I think if you, if you look at the archive documents and, and the project at the Good ISIS, we looked at, at quite a few of them, is that you see a much more developed and larger nuclear weapons program than, than was known before. So that, that's one of the first headlines. In that program, which was going to build five nuclear weapons and build many more after that, um, you had many facilities that were never known about until the discovery of the archive and important facilities, facilities like where they were going to make weapon-grade uranium cores for the nuclear weapons, places where they were planning to do underground nuclear tests. So you have, a, you have much more information about the structure and scope of that nuclear weapons program. And one of the interesting things about it is, is that Iran didn't build those weapons. And in the archive, the documents, there's documents to describe their memorandum of meetings where they're kind of rolling back their plans. And, and clearly what was happening was that, in a sense, the maximum pressure of 2003, U.S. invading Iraq, already being in Afghanistan, led the Iranians to make a, a very secret decision not to build those weapons. But the archive also shows that it didn't stop the nuclear weapons program. It mm. downsized it and reoriented, but it didn't stop it. And, and so, what we were able to do is take that information of this highly structured nuclear weapons program where people are identified, programs are clearly delineated, and then move it forward into more toward today using information that the International Atomic Energy Agency had collected that was available through open sources to try to characterize the nuclear weapons program in Iran today. Oh, that's fascinating. Let, let me... Uh... Let me present to you uh, an argument that you hear often. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in preparation for uh, meeting you today, I, I pulled up this article, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's Nuclear Nothing Burger from the, from the New York Times, written by Steve Simon. And what he says there is, in arguing that there's nothing new here, that, look, we had in 2007 the national intelligence estimate which said that the Iranians halted the program. Uh, y yes, yes, they have this archive sitting in a derelict warehouse, so derelict the, Isra the Israelis could walk in and take it. Obviously, they're not using it. And so you yourself are saying, well, they have halted in some sense. But so are you saying that the NIE of 2007 is wrong, or are you saying that we need to understand it differently? Well, in a certain way, both. I mean. Mm -hmm. The, the, it's also, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that NIE. They're, they had moderate confidence that the program had not restarted. Where they were successful was they identified that, that something had led the Iranians to close down the Ahmad plan. Uh -huh. What they missed was this continuation at a lower level, better camouflaged. And so 
um, it's important to, to look carefully at what the NIE actually says. There were dissenting entities, uh -huh. intelligence agencies that dissented with this idea you could characterize it as, a, as the halt or that, that it hadn't been restarted. Um, and, and when you look in the archive, you do see you, one, of the, the, in, uh, one of the revelations of the archive was is that the Fordow plant, which was discovered This is by the underground bunker underground, yeah, outside of Fordow in the hills. And, and, and the intelligence community in the West came to high confidence. It was in Richmond plant in early 2009 mm. and then exposed it. That was actually being built under a mod to make weapon-grade uranium. And that was not known. Uh -huh. And in fact, we think that's one of the sites that continued. It was such a high priority to Iran to create a, a way to make weapon-grade uranium that it continued. Uh, it, but we think there was a one-year halt in construction from 2003 through 2004, and then it ramped up again. Um, and, then, and, and, and based on interviews with inspectors who went in there, we think the plant was designed to make weapon-grade uranium in 2009, but once they were discovered, they cleaned it out and changed the nature of the, of the essentially the piping. Now, in the going back to the NIE, in the NIE, they defined, in a sense, the nuclear weapons program as weaponization work uh -huh. and undeclared or secret uranium enrichment or fuel fabrication or fuel cycle plants. The intelligence community clearly missed Fordow. They uh -huh. did not know it was part of a mod. And so you already see holes in, in, in the 2007 NIE. And one of the things that we're, we're calling for in the book is we're not faulting Western intelligence. They've done a pretty good job at understanding what's going on. And, and Israel's successes recently kind of even proved that point more directly by seizing the archive. But, and, but Sorry, if I could, uh, let, let me repeat back to you what I just heard and you tell me if I'm misinterpreting. The, the issue with the 2007 NIE then is how do you define the word halt? And they're, they're saying halt with respect specifically to, uh, to uh, direct work on weaponization. But there's a total program and what the, what the Iranians have done is they have halted work, immediate work on some of the more um, production scale. The production, produ of, the production the of the immediate production of nuclear weapons. But they're laying down all kinds of capability that would allow them to quickly go to production should they make that decision. Is that the, is that? No, the, that's correct. That's, that's correct. A, and that's where we ended up. Was that was that it went from a program to build the bomb itself to a program in a sense to be ready to build the bomb. And, and, and to be able to do it on, on sort of short order. And to disguise, and to disguise facilities um, and processes that are, um, that are being built in order to have a nuclear weapons production capability to disguise those as, as, as more innocuous things. Yeah, it, it, enrichment. Enri I mean, and Fordow was a key part of the Ahmad plan. Um, Iran goes ahead and builds it, it gets caught, it clear, declares it a civil site. It can be converted back to producing weapon-grade uranium within a few weeks. Iranians even say that. Yes. And so what you actually have today, and we use this term, and we, we, we came across a program like this in Taiwan. It's sort of a program to be able to build nuclear weapons on demand, mm. that, the, that you create an infrastructure um, and get ready to do it. And in the case of Taiwan, the leadership wanted to be able to have a nuclear weapon in three to six months, and that's what they were working for. And, and they, the source of plutonium would be a safeguarded research reactor. And the US was so upset by all this when it discovered it, largely due to having a spy in the program, it demanded the whole thing be shut down. They demanded the research reactor be shut down. All the weapons teams had to be dismantled. And so, so this is a nuclear weapons program, but it's not, a, it's not the way people think of threshold states. You know, they have some separated plutonium somewhere. This is a program where they're really thinking through how do you build nuclear weapons and to do it quickly. And we, that's what we think Iran has evolved toward. And that, and that Ahmad in 2003 had a major problem the Al Qadir slash Fordow site was not near completion. They mm -hmm. had no source of weapon grade uranium. They do now. 
And so we think Iran is closer to nuclear weapons today than it was in 2003 when it had its crash program. They haven't decided to build them. And that's a lot of the disagreement. It's, it's a, dis dis a difference in definition of halt, but also that we don't think that just because you're not building nuclear weapons, building the major components of nuclear weapons, that you don't have a nuclear weapons program. Right, right. Uh, so back um, when they were first arguing about the JCPOA, uh, John, and there was this whole question about the, uh, the possible military dimensions, uh, and, the, uh, and the Iranians had to disclose, they had to make a disclosure to the IAEA about the PMD. Um, they clearly did not disclose. I mean, this is what, right? What, right? Does that, does that uh, put them in violation of the NPT? Well, Ahmad is clearly in violation. And, and also having this archive, because it was curated, it's, you, know, you can see stamps on the documents, um, it was preserved, um, the lack of kind of they didn't just They didn't just throw it all into boxes and toss it away and forget about it. This, no. was, this was being held so they could use, for when that moment when they decide that they want to move forward, they have the, the documentation to go back and look no, at. And that's right. And, and so it, it, and the possession of this secret archive is, is a violation of its nonproliferation commitments. It's certainly a violation of the JCPOA, JCPOA's commitment that Iran will in no manner have any kind of nuclear weapons program or seek nuclear weapons. So what the archive shows is that when Iran signed up to the JCPOA, when it was implemented in, in the beginning of 2016, it was already in violation of it. So yeah, the, so from day one, it's in violation. And, uh, uh, but let's, let's talk a little bit more about this question of NPT, because it, it keeps coming up. I saw recently reporters ask the State Department spokesman, whether, uh, uh, whether Iran was in violation of the NPT. Uh, he refused to answer uh, what the government's position is. Uh, your, I, I, I take it your position is they definitely are in violation. Yeah, yeah it's because hard to all, do it on a day-to-day -day basis, but yes. All of these, by, by, by the fact of not disclosing all of these different, uh, these, these different sites that you now know about from, from the Ahmad program. Um, but there's, there's another issue uh, uh, that I'm reading about in your reports which is the IAEA has discovered by, in investigating sites, uh, nuclear material. It's asked the Iranians for information about that to come to explain it, and they're not coming forward. That also would be a violation of the NPT, would it not? Well, it, it gets into yes and no. I mean, it, it's, there's an implementing agreement called the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement that, uh, that the state agrees to so there can be inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency. So traditionally, questions like that devolve to is it a violation of the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement? I mean, you can argue if you're violating the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, you must be violating the NPT's kind of safeguards conditions. So can I, but, sorry, can I just for the, the, the benefit of some of, the, um, some of the viewers who aren't up on all this, let me let me describe to you in layman's terms what I understand, sure. and you can tell me if, if I'm uh, correct. So the Iranians have signed up to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. As a result of that, they sit down with the IAEA. Any country that signs up for it sits down with the IAEA, and, and they arrive at a comprehensive safeguards agreement, which is the, which is the deal between that country and the IAEA about what uh, coming clean about their program and inspecting inspection, it, inspection it, of the, about the inspections. nuclear material facilities. And, and in it, the country pledges to not have any undeclared nuclear material. And so if, if the IE discovers undeclared nuclear material, because again, it can't always know, is it being used in a bomb program? Is it being used you know, just because somebody's crazy and wants it? So they, they shouldn't be expected to work out every detail if, they, if the existence of undeclared nuclear material um, is a violation of the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement. In this case, they actually know more. I mean, they... They, the IAEA. Uh, that's right. Under the new Director General, Grossi, they've been using the archive documentation, and they picked the sites carefully that they wanted to visit. Um, and they, one was a pilot um, uranium conversion facility built under the Ahmad plan and never declared by Iran, mm. um, and not known to the IAEA or the Western intelligence. 
Um, another one was a test site for testing the larger subcomponents of nuclear weapons um, called Maravon. And, and the uranium conversion facility was called the Tehran plant. And so they, they figured there they probably was undeclared material at these sites. Iran made it difficult to get in. Pressure was raised. They got in. They took environmental samples. They had found um, the traces of undeclared uh, uranium. They asked the Iranians about it, and the answers have not been satisfactory. So just so I understand the timeline, the, the, these are these sites in which, in which the IAEA has found uh, um, undeclared uranium, or apparently undeclared uranium, uh, became known to the IAEA as a result of the Israeli archive. archive. Yes, right, and only because they didn't. They, they, for example, the Maravan site was known to them that its existence was known to them, and some of the activities, very important testing activities, um, one test in particular that was done there was known to the IAEA, but they didn't know where it was. The archive identifies where its location, and it's in a relationship with three other um, subcomponent testing sites because they work mm. together as a unit. You know, another one was Parchin, another one was a place called Sanjarian, uh, and there's one that um, that we've not been able to locate. Um, and uh, and we, we, the good ISIS, yeah, or the good ISIS, we, yeah. uh, it, it, and some of this has to do. Some of our work was disrupted by COVID. I mean, it, it became impossible to travel to Israel during mm. the last mm. eight months of, of, this, of this effort. But Israeli and Western intelligence, they know where this site is. I, just, we think so. Yeah. We think this one is known. And, uh. and, but we have, a, for example, one of the documents to, over a seven-month period describes the number of tests done at each of these four sites. And you can see in the, you know, the, the tests start smaller. Um, you know, in some cases, we know exactly what they were testing, the components, and then they grow bigger. And later in the process, there's testing starting at Maravon when they're when they're going to the larger mock-ups of the of the of the components. So I think it's very, I think it's pretty clear from everything you've said that when when John Kerry when he was selling the JCPOA and he said we know everything, that we clearly we, we we did not know everything. No, that's right. We didn't know a lot. And 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 what's problematic in that um, was one is is that it it was used to belittle the International Atomic Energy Agency effort to establish that Iran had a peaceful nuclear program, which is a rigorous, difficult process and needs the support of major powers like the United States. But it also, it, it misled us on a very important security question. How close is Iran to building nuclear weapons? And the archive says, closer than you think. Oh, I see, that's fascinating. So l l let me ask you a couple of uh, questions about what you just said. Because I've, I've talked to you before, and uh, if I understand what motivates you, what, what, what uh, drives you to get up in the morning, it's that you really believe in the NPT, sure. and you want the NPT to work. Yeah. And, and, and as you just said, the, the position that the United States has taken by saying, well, our intelligence knows everything, so we don't have to, um, uh, we don't have to force them to come clean about all these things, it actually, it actually guts the N NPT or weakens it. Yeah, it definitely weakens it. And, and, yeah. because it and, and what's tragic in a way is the IA knows how to do denuclearization. I mean, it did it in South Africa. I mean, there, the country decided to give up nuclear weapons and they went in and, and pretty quickly were able to verify that that program had actually been dismantled. And they got the cooperation of the South Africans. They were able to verify what the U.S. did in Taiwan. And so they, they know that if Iran is willing to cooperate, they can, they can provide confidence to the world that this, we call it a nuclear weaponization pillar, uh -huh. um, is crippled, is broken, and, and can't be used. So I think it's, it's an it's a approach to dealing with the, the whole question of Iran's nuclear weapons program that somehow got set aside and delegitimized. By, by the discussions and the implementation of the JCPOA. I mean, mm. the JCPOA was well intended. I mean, they, but it, it's the choices that were made and the way it was implemented, it, it undermined the IA inspections on this vital question of, is this a peaceful nuclear program? Now, the IAEA, uh, again, this is something I know from your reports, has repeatedly uh, refrained from saying 
certifying that Iran's program is peaceful. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? Yeah, and the way the language in the um, in the safeguards business is they they can't provide confidence of the absence of undeclared nuclear materials and activities. Uh -huh. And so that's, for them, the key, key measurement is, is this question. Now, you can't prove a negative, so that's why it has this convoluted construction of developing confidence. There's a process you go through, looking at things multiple times, checking in, looking for contradictions to try, and that's the question of building confidence. But we know you, when I say we, the, the people like yourself who deal with these issues, you know what it feels like when a country has come clean. Sure. And because we've seen it. And uh, in the case of South Africa, I guess Taiwan, uh, uh, Kazakhstan, is that another one? Yeah, I didn't, we didn't study that, but we've seen yeah. countries where they gave it up. I mean, Canada had a nuclear weapons program in uh -huh. the 40s, um, and they gave it up, and you clearly you know they gave it up. And you can tell in this case that it, it hasn't been given up, or at least it, yeah, does, it doesn't no. give you that feeling that it has. Not yeah, I mean, that's okay. Um, so, uh, another argument, or actually, Phil, you'll have to edit this bit. Let me just say, back to the IAEA and the way it conducts inspections. Um, my impression is, again, from, from reading your reports, that there's a reluctance on the part of the IAEA sometimes to go track down some of these issues that the Israelis have raised, that things that they have informed the IAEA about. There was a there was an issue of a um, uh, there was an issue of another uh, warehouse in Tehran mm -hmm. uh, where Prime Minister Netanyahu was urging the IAEA, IAEA uh, to go investigate, and they and, and they didn't go. Uh, do I have that right? First of all, is that yeah, and it's and it's and there there's different parts. I mean, if a country comes to the IA with information, um, they they don't want to be dependent on one country. They want to do their own work, where they incorporate that information, and that's and that's how it should be. Right. And and back in in '04, there was the production of something called the laptop documents, which were an inside look at parts of the nuclear weapons program, very incomplete. Um, the I spent two three or more years studying those, collecting additional information, resisted even internally, jumping to a conclusion. Then when they finished, they came out and said, these are genuine documents, uh -huh. points to a nuclear weapons program. We have big questions, and there's a lot of incompleteness. In the case of Turkish Abad, that information was That's different. the name of the, That's of the site. The, the site. What it was was a, uh, the Israelis alleged that it was a site that was filled with shipping containers and also had some stuff inside a warehouse that was related to um, the Ahmad plan equipment, uh, materiel. And so it, it, it was, in a sense, the, you know, the other side of the archive. I mean, the archive describes lots of equipment activities. Well, much of that was in these shipping containers, according to the Israelis. And they went to the IA and said, look, they're starting to move the shipping containers. You better go now. And they wouldn't. Mm. And, and so here you have a case where, you know, if you have a, you know, something happening that quickly, the IA should have been able to go. They demonstrated that capability in Iraq many times. They could move within hours to go after a, a, a site. A moving target. And they had the authority in the case of Iraq to demand to go there. They can go anywhere they want in a country if they suspect particularly undeclared nuclear material. And, and so the, and even if they don't, they still have a right to go there if they suspect untoward act, activities in violation of the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement. So they could have gone and they chose not to. And Netanyahu gave a press conference pretty much right after the last of the shipping containers were, um, were removed. How would you... Uh, totally you, frustrated, I, I, and, and I, I, as, I, as, as he should have been. I'd, I'd ask you to put yourself in the... Uh, in the uh, in the shoes of Amano, who at the time was the uh, the head of the IAEA, what would you imagine uh, were his considerations when he decided not to move on this? Well, one is is that it, information came from a single country and, and a country with a, a big stake in the Middle East. So, so they Israel. don't want to become the, they want to be very careful not to become the tool of that's right. of an actor in a conflict. Yeah. Yeah. But but we did a, a post after after the fact investigation. Um, and, and it, you could clearly see the shipping containers disappear over three months. 
And so the fact that you did you you your organization yeah, did just but through satellite sat imagery through satellite commercial satellite imagery. So they so, could also they had the, yeah. sat, they could they could go to satellite imagery and they they could actually ask member states for satellite. That's imagery. right. And then then after that it they all been moved. You could see they were actually covering up the site, putting in dirt material. So they were and and we know that from Iranian activities in other countries. I mean, when they start moving in debris to cover things, and it, it's not a, it's a, it's, you should make you, it should make you more suspicious. Right. And so, the certainly it would have been a risk for Amano to use the information and acted upon it. But what an opportunity he had, and blew away to catch the Iranians red-handed, and let you know let the Iranians explain why they're not going to let the IA into an innocuous-looking warehouse um, in Tehran. So now, um, you know, when, when, when people like me argue that um, all meaningful restrictions on the uh, Iranian program under the JCPOA end by 2031, uh, the response coming from the defenders of the JCPOA is that that's not true because they're still members of the NPT. But, uh, and so, and they'll still have the comprehensive safeguards agreement and possibly even the additional protocol and, and so on and so forth. But what, what I'm hearing you say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm, this is a statement in the form of, a, a question in the form of a statement. What I'm hearing you say is that um, they're already in violation of the NPT. They're not answering the questions that the IAE has put to it about, about, uh, uh, about, discoveries of undisclosed material that the IAEA has made. Um, so we really can't rely simply on the NPT right. with regard to them. Yeah, because, yeah. because they've never come clean and they're clearly Yeah, not. in two ways. One is, is that um, they're historically a, a cheater. Yeah. And, and if, if the NPT was enough, then the JCPOA would never have been needed. I mean, if, if that's all you're worried about, um, but they're a cheater, and and so you want to have additional limitations put upon them in order to, if you can't discover the cheating, to kind of try to constrain their activities. The other thing is there's a limit, there's a weakness in the NPT. It allows countries, if they have a peaceful program, which Iran doesn't, it hasn't been certified, mm. but if it did, then they can have enrichment programs and reprocessing programs. And that's a problem in that part of the world where the U.S. policy has been no enrichment, no reprocessing um, in civil nuclear programs. It's what they convinced the UAE to accept, the gold standard. It won't reprocess, it won't enrich. They're pushing Saudi Arabia to do the same. And you say we pushed Taiwan in the past. And that's right, in Taiwan it was the same. And so, so, they, they so, it's better, so it's worse to be an ally of the United States than an enemy, because the well, enemy gets that's uh, right. And yeah. you, do, you certainly don't want your enemies doing what you don't allow your allies to do. Uh -huh. So it's, it's, you know, so the, the, it's the NPT, one is, it's, we don't trust the NPT when it comes to Iran, because they've cheated so much, had so many hidden activities, undeclared activities, nuclear weapons activities, and it has an inherent limitation that it opens a door for, for enrichment and reprocessing programs in very dangerous parts of the world. So uh, there's another argument out there. And, and just add, and that's why it's so upsetting that these sunsets end so quickly, relatively quickly, for in Middle Eastern time. Right. You know, Ron is patient, and it, and it never stops working. I mean, people can argue, you know, the and JCPOA somehow limits certain activities, enrichment level, you know, amount of... LEU, the number of centrifuges deployed, but it doesn't stop um, other work that had, that's bolstering their ability to build centrifuges, bolstering their knowledge of centrifuges, um, bolstering their, their ability to get the equipment and gain the expertise to better operate um, centrifuges. I'll come, to come back to that in a second to ask you about some of those capabilities and some of the sunsets that are coming up. But first, let me, let me take you back to the political argument that we're having now. Because one, one argument that we're hearing is that all of this um, recalcitrance on the part of the Iranians and the difficulties is a result of the, it's a reaction to Trump's maximum pressure. So of course they're not answering the IAEA because of Trump's maximum pressure. And how, how do you respond to that? 
Well, one, they made a decision in 2008, um, and, and we had documents from um, a, a Western intelligence agency and from IA, senior IA officials. Iran made a decision they were no longer going to really cooperate with the IA, and they haven't cooperated since 2008. The, the show that happened in, in 2015 during the implementation of the JCPOA, IA produces what some call a final, you know, or close yeah. the file. I mean, the IA would never close a file, but some cl claim that. It was largely just a list of unanswered questions. That, so, that in Iran other words, had never, never answered. In, in, uh, in other words, the, the requirement, the requirement that the, the requirement of the JCPOA, that uh, was a, is a preliminary requirement before the, the JCOA, JCPOA kicked into force that the um, that the Iranians respond to the IA, to all the unanswered questions of the IAEA. Um, they they uh, the Iranian we, we gave them a clean bill of health in that regard. The, the United States did because they because they gave some kind of response, but the response was wholly inadequate. That's right. So they got so they got credit for participating in the process, but not actually in the substance. That's right. No, that, that's exactly what happened. And then, and then of course there were some you know some positive accomplishments of the JCPOA, getting Iran back under the additional protocol, which is a supplement to the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement that where the country agrees to further transparency steps, provides more information, makes access to to uh, facilities and and undeclared sites easier. But Iran doesn't, it fulfills that marvelously at declared nuclear sites. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it's the yeah. mo one of the most, it, it's accurate to say it's the most comprehensive um, verification arrangement of declared fuel cycles uh -huh. in the world. But it fails utterly on facilitating access to military sites, many of which were engaged in making nuclear weapons, and now we know at least three have evidence of undeclared uranium. So it calls it calls to mind the old joke about the guy who at, at night who's under the street light looking for his I car keys. I didn't want to give that, but yeah, yeah. it does. And and and, and they, the guy says, "Where what, where did you lose him?" He says, "Over there." And <laughs> why are you looking here? Because the light's better. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 explain to me. I mean, uh, I'm actually uh, as much as I distrust the Iranian government. I mean, my my view is that if their lips are moving, they're lying. If they're snoring, they're lying. I'm still a little bit shocked by what you just said, that, that since 2008, they have not cooperated with the IAEA, except in a completely pro forma way. Mm -hmm. How come then the IAEA, now we, we have the, the Director Grossi, how, how come they don't make a dramatic statement to that effect, that, that, that Iran, is, Iran is, is, is not in compliance with the NPT, and, uh, um, and Iran is, is stonewalling us in every yeah. regard. Part of it's inherently conservative organization. It doesn't like to make waves. It prefers the quiet approach. I mean, one of the you know, um, times when they didn't do that was, was a result of essentially being hit with a two by four by the international community after they so utterly failed in Iraq in 1991, and, and they, if at that point in time, changed tactics and be, were quite aggressive and, and not conservative in going after the Iraqi nuclear weapons program. But under tradi more traditional safeguards, they, it's very hard to get them to push a conflict. They, they're always seeking consensus, or at least the vast majority of the board. They want to move forward kind of together. They always want to seek the cooperation of the, of the cheating country. And so it's, it's, it's a very difficult for them. And if, one of, and if some of the major players, for example, the United States, doesn't want them to rock the boat, uh -huh. as was clearly the case with the JCPOA, uh -huh. it's not in their nature to go up against the, you know, one of the, if not the foremost, supporter of the IEA both financially and politically. So, so it's very tough for them 
to, to work without the support of the Board of Governors. And in fact, a lot of the problem isn't the IEA, it's the Board of Governors. Uh -huh. It's how it's structured, it's how voices like Iran have so much influence there, how it's backed by countries like Russia, who really don't have the best interests of the IEA at heart. Um, and the U.S. has to constantly fight that battle, and, and I think it chose not to fight that battle when it came time to implement the JCPOA. So Director Grossi, he's, before he's going to take a step, like let's say we had this example of uh, Netanyahu goes and it comes to him and says, there's, there's this site, uh, Turkuzabad, is that what it's called? Turkuzabad. Turkuzabad. Tur uh, there's this site, Turkuzabad, they have containers there, they're moving them. Even if he has other sources of information other than simply uh, Netanyahu, plus he has the archive and so on, he's gonna look to, he's gonna look to Washington, he's gonna look to Moscow, he's gonna look to Beijing before he moves. That's right. Yeah. And, and they don't wanna, you know, one of the signals that went out, um, and, and a, a former very senior legal uh, official at, at the IE told me, during 2015, she'd retired. You know, the, the IA was thrown under the bus. Mm. And, and, and in that case, you don't go and do things, you know, in a sense, poke the bear, that, and do things that could bring down the JCPOA or force this, the dispute resolution mechanism to come into play when Iran says no, 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 no. Right. And so the IA, I think, was very timid about, and, and still is, about bringing down the JCPOA through its activities. So I have here uh, uh, on my desk a uh, statement by Ned Price, the, the, the State Department spokesman. He's asked by a, a reporter, um, a, a reporter claims that uh, we do not have the ability to go into military sites uh, in, in in Iran, and he says we do. The IAEA can go wherever it wants to go in in uh, in, in Iran. Um, and if I understand what you're saying, he's an, the the state Ned Price, State Department spokesman, who's in favor of the JCPOA, was on Obama's team uh, before. What he's 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 not he's not out and out lying because there is a theoretical ability of the IAEA to do any of those things. But in practical terms, it doesn't have those abilities. Is, is no, that... it, it's, it's really the, the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, and people often don't understand this. The IAEA has a right to go anywhere in the country. And, but the trouble is you need to exercise your right, uh -huh. and it's difficult. And the additional protocol was brought into play to make it easier for the IAEA to exercise that right and also to provide gain more information so that they could exercise the right more intelligently. So it, but the problem is, is that if, if they ask to go and they're told no, then what happens? And so when they know they're going to get a no, they don't ask. That's right. Because they don't want to, because otherwise, if they got the no, that would force them to then force the dispute mechanism, which might bring down the JCPOA. That's right. I think that's my view of what took place. And, and what the IE did under Amano was kind of go after universities that were associated with a mod or could be associated with an ongoing pro program. Iranians were giving them lots of trouble. Uh -huh. um, the, and, and then never answering questions directly on, on related to, to the Ahmad plan, the, the, what the IE knew at the time. So, so the, the, Limited as it was, they the, still they had information that, that Iran was denying existed. The case, the case that's most famous is the Parchin mm -hmm. case. Um, uh, the where weaponization work was going on, we we know. I think right. is that right? No, it's in, it's highly documented in the archive what happened there. And uh, uh, but the IAEA has not been is not allowed to go there. That's right. And and there are they they just not asking? Is that the is that is that the case? Well, or? they they went they and we were involved in a, a mistake on Parchin back in two thousand and five. Uh huh. Um, and some of it was driven by false information perpetuated by the U.S. government. But the, we, we and, and the IA internally, independent of us, came up with a site at Parchin. Parchin's a huge complex. We came up with a site. 
and thought, oh, this looks like a place that nuclear weapons development work can be taking place. And the IA demanded to go. The Iranians gave him a lot of trouble, but it finally let him in. And the sites were not capable like they looked like from space. And, and, and that mistake then makes it harder for the IA to ask to go someplace else. Uh -huh. And so, and Iran uses that. Uh, and interestingly enough, in the satellite imagery of that site, um, a site called Shahi Borgerdi is visible, an underground site near, near that site. Um, you have this tunnel complex, which we saw in the imagery, but we didn't realize that that was part of the Ahmad plan. And, and Western <laughs> oh, intelligence okay. didn't either. The Israelis have told us many times that that site was not known to Western intelligence, uh. but it was in our sights in a way. But then you roll forward, the IE got information about another location at Parchin several years later that was involved in high explosive tests related to nuclear weapons development. And they, and they asked to go there. And Iran said no. And, and the Iranians then proceeded to, to kind of dismantle the inside of the buildings, camouflage them, pave over the, the ground, um, did all kinds of things to disrupt. Um, it became very controversial. There were many people who claimed there was nothing ever there. I mean, and the IA hears this too. You have vocal proponents saying it's all not true. You know, they, and, and uh, governments sometimes side with those people. And, and, um, and so you have a situation where the IA has to deal with its member states and also has to deal with the controversy outside where there was a strong constituent, partially stirred up by people like Zarif. I mean, it, his activities in the United States, I think should be investigated as, as, as creating a, a foreign lobbying uh, effort within the United States and, and certainly manipulating NGOs uh, through track two events that, that really have often just led to uh, these groups coming back with Isra Iranian positions, technical and political, to try to implement within the US. And so, so all this is playing out and it makes it very complicated for the IE to do its business. And Iran sticks to its message, never had a nuclear weapons program, it's all lies, and, it, and we're not gonna let you in. So, so, let's, so in this, maybe I'm taking a long time to explain this, but no, it's uh, no, it's it's fascinating, and I uh, a and lot sorry of for it the was aside, a lot. No, no, a lot of it was not. I was not familiar with. Actually. Yeah, and then and then it Parchin became such a symbol that there was no way that that the JCPOA could be implemented without something happening at Parchin because it was so obvious that the evidence was solid, and the cover up was extreme, um, and we charted it every couple months for you know, from 2012 onward. Um, and, and so they, the, they came up with a kind of a half, half effective uh, agreement where the Iranians would take the samples. The IA wouldn't. They could, yeah. Romano could walk through with somebody, one of the buildings, not, not the other. There's another sensitive building at the yeah. site. And, but it, what was interesting is that- But that's, I, like, that's like me giving my own urine sample for, for drug well, testing. that's and, right. But, and and you, you, don't, you, you don't see me actually fill the cup. That's right, and, but the IA is so clever sometimes, they found the illicit drug in your urine. <laughs> so, so despite that cover up, despite all the efforts to keep the IA from taking its own samples, the IA still found evidence of undeclared uranium at Parchin. Oh really? And to this day, the Iranians refuse to and they answer. Ha they haven't answered. Yeah. But, so they, but they still got credit as part for of the JCPO up. process right. for for checking uh, that box for checking the box, the uh. process box. And, uh, so let, let's move on to the JCPOA itself, and um, let, let's just start with on the basis of what you understand now from the Ahmad program and fr from the nuclear archive, what it's told you about the Ahmad program. The, the JCPOA, uh, in your view, is, is inadequate. I think you've always had the, at a certain point, you, uh, with the Obama administration, you dissented. And, and, and yeah, we, didn't, we never endorsed it, we never opposed it. I mean, it's just, because uh, we look at these things, it's a big document, and parts we like, parts we don't. You know, we think it needs to, to be either replaced or amended. I mean, really, the issues so, are there, need to be dealt with. So if you if you if if I could make you king for the for the uh, of the world for a moment and and you could shore up the JCPOA in three key ways 
or four key ways. What what are the what are the things that you would want to change about it? Well, there there's many, but but if I'm limited to three, um, lengthening the sunsets. Yeah. I mean, you want to go multi generation. You know, I don't know an engineer's professional life on a project, maybe ten years. You want to get it two three generations of engineers, so you get away from the people who really spent their life knowing it. You want to make it hard for Ron to just keep those people employed uh -huh. um, and last out the, the, the halt, which essentially was 10 years with the, with the JCPOA, because that's when they can start expanding their centrifuge program, starting in uh, 2025. And, um, and then another is, is the, you want the breakout times to be longer than in the JCPOA, which in our estimate are seven to 12 months. You want them to be more like eighteen to twenty-four, so there'd be a small. So that means smaller stockpiles or yeah. a smaller number of centrifuges. Smaller, stockpiles are okay the way they are um, in the JCPOA, but smaller numbers of centrifuges, not destroyed advanced centrifuges, not stockpiled um, or stored. So they. Wait, so in other words, the JCPOA allowed them to mothball. That's right. Advanced centrifuges. Advanced the centrifuges. I, it was called the IR two M, a thousand of them, and they've been redeploying them. And in fact, one of the things where this is even further supported is how quickly Iran went from being in compliance with the, the nuclear limitations yes. to having a breakout timeline that's approaching two months. So when they can announce Within that they're year. enriching to 60%, 60 percent, that's that in that in itself, the fact that they could do that so quickly that's right. is a is a, is a blow against the JCPOA, that yeah. the conditions just aren't enough. And in fact, if you're worried about what's going on now. Yeah. and think this is a big deal, you should be terrified with what will happen in 2030 when all the limits of these major limits are unraveled and Iran can build thousands and thousands and deploy those advanced centrifuges, have bigger stocks of enriched uranium. So, so I think in a, just a general sense, today is a concern. 2030, you should be terrified of, but it, but under it, the JCPOA. And uh, I, I just uh, debated recently in a private event, Steve Simon, about these issues. Uh, Steve Simon, who called the nuclear archive a nothing burger. And, and who is he? Uh, just uh, to... uh, he was a, he was a uh, Middle East advisor to Obama, uh, and he's now a professor um, at Colgate University. Can but, you edit out that part, what I'm asking? I mean, it, Oh, yeah, 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 sure, we can. Uh, I should. Know, I may know him. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, he he argued that this is this ten years is really a very long time, and it gives us a lot. I my my view is that it, not just that we're going to have an, an, be in a nightmare in ten years' time, but other countries looking at this and they can see the they can see the sunsets coming into play between now and tw and twenty thirty one. Um, and they're, they're not going to want to be. Uh, they're not going to want to be behind the curve. They're not going to wait to 2031. Right. They're, so they're going to start their own nuclear programs now. Right. So I mean, when I mean a nuclear weapons program, so we're we're going to be in a nuclear weapons arms race if we're not in one already. As no, a result, and you of this. see it in Saudi Arabia already. There's you know worries about clandestine fuel cycle capabilities. That, you know, is Saudi Arabia going to approach Pakistan for? Help. I mean, our in our own analysis, what we worry about, and, and this is a little bit, is, is certainly speculative, is, is Saudi Arabia would approach Pakistan to buy a safeguarded uranium enrichment plant. I mean, right. forget the weapons. I mean, they'll never do that, unless there's some war happening. But if if they're, if uh, and then the U.S. would probably step in. So the if the but, U.S. knows, yeah. But it, well, I mean, if there's an actual war, yeah. where Saudi Arabia's existence is threatened by Iran, but the but, the, but they could buy a uranium enrichment plant under safeguards, and there's nothing that, that would be in complete compliance with the NPT. U.S., if it, if it pushes Saudi Arabia away, um, would have very little leverage to stop them. Uh, the Iranians certainly worry about that, um, that Saudi Arabia is not going to develop an indigenous nuclear capability like they've done, but they'll go and just buy it. And that has some advantages and disadvantages. Um, and it clearly has the advantage you suddenly have it and it's turnkey and, and you walk in and take over. It has a disadvantage you don't really know how to run it well. But, but that's what Iran did with Bushir. So you, you, you have a, a turnkey nuclear power reactor. The Russians taught them how to run it for a couple of years and now they're taking over. Saudi Arabia could do the same 
with a uranium enrichment plan. So, so I think, yeah, it, you can't wait 10 years. And where I think, where the Trump administration, and I don't think their the full story is ever debated, is they clearly felt that striking now, in a sense, to build maximum pressure made more sense than waiting to do it. And if you mm. intend to you know, not tolerate these sunsets, and you fully believe that the sunsets are happening too quickly, and when they do happen, it's bad news, then why not go now? I mean, that's, that's how I interpreted the, fundamentally the, the, what they did. So the, it, it, it looks like we're on the verge, if I'm reading the diplomacy correctly, in Vienna, it looks like we're on the verge of a return to the JCPOA. Um, first of all, do you have a, a sense of exactly what that means, return to the JCPOA? No. I mean, it, one is, is that the Iranians have a principle, which is we'll never destroy centrifuges. I mean, this was, they told this to U.S. negotiators in I don't know, 2012, 2013, um, that that was a red line, and they stuck to it and got, got away with it. Um, so are they going to destroy the advanced centrifuges they've built and deployed that are in clear violation of the JCPOA, just even exist? Uh -huh. Or are they going to storm? Or are they going to continue to run them? Right. So I think there's big questions over. And we know from recent press reports that, that the, or recent press reports claim that they are saying they will not. Yeah, and that's, and that's always been their position. And, uh -huh. and, and I think it's important that, that the EU and the, and the United States hold firm that no destruction of these centrifuges, no reduction of sanctions. That it's, it is a tripwire because it gets right to the heart of this issue of why the sunsets are so dangerous, is that there's these other activities that happen. In this case, they seized an opportunity after uh, Trump withdrew U.S. participation to race ahead on uh, advanced centrifuge development. Uh -huh. And they're trying to lock that in and preserve it so that they can just pick up again um, in, in a couple years. I mean, that's when they can start deploying le legitimately more IR6s so, and other advanced centrifuges. So between, between uh, uh, April of 2018 and now, they have deployed uh, more advanced centrifuges and learned more about them. That's right. And, and uh, so when you say lock it in, lock it in by keeping the facilities up and running, are there ways to lock it in? If they did agree as a part of a returning to the JCPOA, if they did agree uh, to, uh, to put those centrifuges in mothballs, is there a way that they lock in their knowledge of what they've learned? Yeah, well, they, they'll, their knowledge is gained. I mean, yeah. that, so that's in, a, in, in the, the individual experience. And that's been lost. And so yeah. that's a setback. And, and, and the U.S. should compensate for that. Some sanctions shouldn't come off. There should be some trade-off. You don't, okay, you gained undermine the, you know, in violation of the JCPOA, okay, well, certain sanctions have to stay because, you know, we can't, we need to match that noncompliance uh -huh. with some kind of um, uh, but, sanction. But not just, not just in terms of punishing them, but in terms of giving ourselves more security. That's right, more so, leverage. Yeah. And, and uh, the other thing is, is you know, the destruction of the centrifuges um, will also send a signal to the Iranians that, that they, if they want to go ahead and violate these things, that it, it'll, it'll mean that they'll have to walk it back physically and, and destroy them. So I, and I don't want to overstate the importance of it because it, because some, and when we've looked at this situation, we've been following the IE safeguards reports, they issue you know, one every, it seems to be one every week or so, you know, of an Iranian violation. You know, the, one of the more recent ones was they were developing a new way to go from 3.5% enriched uranium to 60%, and, and, um, or from natural to 20%. And, and then they were focusing on activities at Fordow. We think they've been rehearsing breakout. It isn't really, uh -huh. it's more than just learning to operate the IR6 uh -huh. better, but it actually looks like they're, they're rehearsing how you would rapidly deploy and escalate the enrichment level and the, and the quantity of enriched uranium. And they're doing that at Fordow. Fordow, but also they, learn, they do things at Natanz too. I mean, the 60% is happening at the pilot plant at Natanz, so they do it wherever, wherever they feel it's the safest to do. Uh -huh. If we just think about the, the timeline of the JCPOA, um, um, and in terms of their, uh, not, not what they've done not what they've done um, in violation of the JCPOA, but just in terms of, of what is permissible. 
what, where are they on advanced centrifuges now in, in, in the JCPOA timeline? Because at, 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 a certain, at a certain point, one of the sunsets uh, comes into play long before uh, 2030 that allows them to do more work with advanced centrifuges. Yeah, they've been, I think they've been playing out year 10. I mean, it's, and, and um, with IR6s, other advanced centrifuges, um, and, and with some other activities that it's kind of they're, they're trying to get past year 10 and jump a couple of years in their ability to deploy advanced centrifuges. And, but, it, but at the same time, they've also, they're trying to undermine some of the other things. They, they, they um, decided to go ahead with making uranium metal, which is completely banned under the JCPO. Even research on it is banned. Mm. They're putting in a line to make uh, uranium metal in, for various different purposes. Um, and one and, of and which it's could completely be, banned because uranium metal is used for weaponization. That's right. That, yeah. So it's banned. Then, then they're also, they did something which I don't quite understand the logic of it. There are certain nuclear material that's exempted from the limits, some 20%, some 3.5%. Some of it's waste, some of it's scrap. But it was a se totally secret deal. When the United States told Congress about this, and it's totally unclassified arrangement, they actually insisted that Congress put it into the SCIF. You had to go into the SCIF to see what these exemptions were about. We managed, despite that, to learn about them because it's, it's unclassified in other countries. Uh -huh. Secret, but unclassified. And, um, and, and one of the things was 20%. A little bit of 20% was exempted. And, um, and lo and behold, last month or so, Iran took this material that was declared unrecoverable, unusable, and they processed it and are now reusing it. Uh -huh. And so, so you have all these little things going on. Why, why do you, that, um, why and, do you think the United States that, would have exempted, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, the, and so what you have here is Iran just proved that these exemptions shouldn't have been granted in the first place. They, they also were gonna use probably an exempted hot cell to process the material after it's irradiated. So they were gonna separate it, it's fresh 20%, recover it, irradiate it for various reasons, civil, and then, and then recover it in an exempted hot cell at a facility. And so, so you, but what it, the signal it should send is these exemptions need to be re-looked re at, we made a mistake. Uh. And what they thought they had, and, and I have senior DOE official argued with me saying, this little bit never could be reused. Forget about it. And we said, well, you know, nuclear material can often be reused. It's called scrap for a reason. Uh -huh. It's not called nuclear waste. And, it, and, it, and it, the scrap was recovered by Iran. So you have a lot of things going on that have to be factored into this recreation of the JCPOA. Wouldn't it have been, uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, I'm just trying to understand the mentality of American officials when they have Iranians demanding that something like this be exempted, and the American official thinks it's absolutely worthless, clearly it's not, <laughs> or they wouldn't be demanding the exemption. Yeah. No? Well, yeah, that's right, but, it, but you couldn't argue it's nuclear waste. I don't, we don't know how much uranium has been, low enriched uranium has been exempted. It's probably quite a bit. Uh -huh. And, um, and you know, it's a 300 kilogram limit, and, and God knows how big the exempted material is. I mean, they won't say. I mean, it's uh -huh. a closely guarded secret. Yeah. And, and one, of the, one of the problems is, is that it's a very complicated process. The JCPOA is a very complicated deal, and in many parts we haven't even talked about. And so you have, you have a situation where the, you, you have to look at so many different things. You, can't, you just can't win on, on, on many. And the Iranians are, you know, it's the most important thing in their life, their nation's existence, is to make the JCPOA as weak as possible and, and while you can get sanctions removed. And, and they're playing the same game now. The United States is, you know, it, it's not the biggest thing in the United States' life by any means. Right. And so you, you have a mismatch between what's in the effort by the Iranians versus the effort by the U.S. And I think that leads us to end up with a, a deal that's weaker. And why the people who do this know nonproliferation extremely well. They know that this, 
undermines the U.S. policy of no enrichment, no reprocessing in regions of tension. They don't want South Korea to reprocess. And, and we talked about they don't want Saudi Arabia, UAE to, to reprocess or enriched. So they know this. So they always say, well, this is the best we could get. Right. And what I'm saying and what we, this book is saying is, no, it isn't. You can do a lot better. Um, and it may take longer. And maybe you'll do the JCPOA and then something else. But then tell me how you're going to do the more. Because I don't believe you if you go the JCPOA route, that this isn't that important a priority to you, that you're not going to just end it there. Tell me how you're going to get to the, to the, the next deal that's longer and stronger. I well, mean, they, they can't get, if they go back to the JCPOA, since because of the sunsets in the JCPOA, they can never get to a longer and stronger agreement. Well, they, no, they could. They could just say, and, and you know, maybe Congress, you know, I don't, I don't want to, not lobbying, but I mean, Congress should pass a law that says if if negotiations, substantive negotiations haven't started a year after the JCPOA goes back into force, sanctions snap back. I mean, that was, in a sense, that was the fixed strategy under the Trump administration was to have that the sunsets were seen as a problem. So what you do is, is that when sunsets start to happen in year 10, U.S. sanctions snap back under U.S. law. There can be off-ramps for the U.S. president, for the international community in some ways through negotiations. But if there's no negotiations that are viewed as credible, then sanctions all snap back. And um, so you could do that with the JCPOA, you know, and, and insist that there be um, a snap back after a year. You know, will they do it? I will not totally convinced. Well, uh... You've totally depressed me. I mean, my my Sorry. <laughs> my not that I not not that I didn't know any of this, or or the, not that I didn't have this kind of general view, but uh, sort of the depth of the problem is now much clearer to me. So my my takeaway from what you've said is, Iran has a nuclear weapons program. It's always had one. The nuclear weapons program has continued under the JCPOA. The JCPOA is already, whatever limited restrictions we, limited, um, uh, whatever uh, partial limitations the JCPOA put on the Iranians is already, are already disappearing. And the chance that we're going to get a longer and stronger agreement is really about nil. Those are my takeaway. Okay. Can you? And I would disagree with the last one. I, okay. I, maybe I'm an optimist, but I think you can get a, a better deal. I mean, I, I'm not sure you get it by a two-step process, but I think you can get a better deal because the Iranians do or are vulnerable to pressure. You, the archive shows that, that they, in secret, and, 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 and did it, a decision they went to great lengths to hide, decided not to build nuclear weapons in 2003 because of fear of what the U.S. could do to them. Because you know, they can calculate. I mean, if Iran got attacked for having WMD that mo many didn't believe existed, except in a very minor way, like chemical weapons, um, my god, the Iranians had a lot to worry about. So, so I think theoretically, can, I think theoretically we could get a longer and stronger agreement. but. Not with the negotiating tact that we've that that, that we've that, that we've uh, that we're currently engaged well, in. I don't know. I, I don't know what they plan to do. I don't want to. I can't read the minds of of the the Biden team to know what they're really. And I don't want to speculate. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get to a, a good endpoint, and and if they can do it through first JCPOA and then a stronger, longer deal, yeah, I'm not going to oppose that or cast aspersions on it. But I do, I would like to see how they plan to do it. And I think as a safety mechanism, probably in the outside community and maybe in Congress, people should start to think about ways to backstop that to ensure that if there isn't a longer, stronger deal, that U.S. sanctions return. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll end on your optimistic note okay. and just say thank you so much. This has been enormously enlightening. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see you back as uh, oh, developments no. continue. Happy to do it. Thank, thank you. you.